Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord, for the privilege of coming together to fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. Lord, you bless us. And Lord, I can only pray that our, our walk, Lord, our attention to you, your word, Lord, our willingness to love one another because of the way you loved us, Lord, I pray that all those things would be strengthened. And Lord, as much as you bless us, Lord, I pray that we would be a blessing to you. And so, Lord, we turn our hearts and our minds to you now, Lord. We ask that you would bless this book as we open it together, as we explore the things that you did and you said and that you taught a long time ago, Lord, but yet you still teach us today. So, Lord, we pray that your spirit would be mighty in our midst. Fill us, Lord, to overflowing. Anoint us to hear. And, Lord, empower us to put into action what we hear. Just thank you in advance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, open with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Mark. We finished Jude, and then which really brought us to the threshold of Revelation. Um, haven't been in Revelation for, and soon it'll be six years. Um, but I didn't feel it was time to, to move into that. And so, good time to go back and get another of the gospel. We did Matthew last time, Mark being the next one in succession. succession. It's been about a year and a half since we've been in a gospel. So I'm excited about this study. Mark is a, a very interesting gospel message amongst the gospel messages. Make it part way through the first chapter this morning. Just look at the first verse. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, with that, we get a little bit of flavor of Mark. Um, little to no lead-in, no real introduction to the book. Mark just gets down to business. And this immediacy that we see in this very first part of this gospel is really the nature of Mark's gospel as a whole. But before we move too far into that, let's just think of a very brief comparison of the gospels. Because there's four of them. Four of them, and there's a reason that there's four of them. There could have been six, there could have been two, but there's a reason there's four. I know that, because it's God's word, and he gave us four. And you think about, you may recall, um, uh, most of us are old enough to when schools still had art classes. Unfortunately, not many do anymore. But you can remember the first time, or the second or third time that you sat in an art class, and you had to draw something that was put before the class, and you marveled, especially the first time, when you looked at everybody's drawings and saw the difference of perspective of the very same thing. I always think back to that lesson of that because I wonder how often you and I stand in the same room, discuss the same topic, look upon the same subject, and really have no clue how different we are interpreting. And so here we have four men inspired by the Holy Spirit who write, this good news, the gospel, which means good news, so that we would have the different perspectives. Because no one could remember everything. Even under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they were still men. And not every one of them could recall everything and not necessarily all recall the same thing that they saw. And so he gives us four different perspectives. And there's audiences, besides just us as the church, there's audiences that they were styled for. And, and, and this is man's interpretation, but I believe it's very accurate. When we consider Matthew, Matthew was written primarily for the Jews. There's so much evidence of that. But we see as we open Matthew, it opens with a genealogy. Because in that culture, there was a need of Matthew to prove that Jesus was the rightful heir to David's throne. And then we skip over Mark, because that's where we're at today. We go, go into Luke, the longest of the four Gospels. And that focus really on the mercies of Jesus, which is might, what you might expect from a doctor. Emphasize the humanity of the Messiah. 
And he knew that his Greek readers, which is what his focus was on, the Greek readers, would identify with the perfect baby who grew up to be the perfect man. And then in John, John being really the oddest one, when I mean odd, not like strange, but odd in the sense, you have the synoptic gospels, which are the first three, of which Mark is one. And then you had John, which really stood on its own in its style. And John opened up his by pointing out the topic of eternity, written to prove the whole, to the whole world that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. And really the subject of so much of John's gospel was Jesus' deity, and the fact that we were to believe on him and to receive the gift of eternal life. And then there's Mark, who we come into today. And Mark really wrote to a Roman audience. And the emphasis of Mark's gospel is on activity. And we notice that right off the bat. It's just a shotgun start. And it stays that way through the entirety of Mark's gospel. It's all about the activity. It's about the immediacy of of what Jesus came to do and what he was doing. And then through his church, us today continues to do. And really the theme, if I had to grab one for the Gospel of Mark, is that Jesus is the servant. Jesus the servant is really what we see in Mark's Gospel message as a center theme. And really if I had to pick one verse from the entirety of the 16 chapters to reflect what this book teaches us, it would come from the 10th chapter of Mark, verse 45. And it's, this is Jesus speaking of himself. And he says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, if anything was going to set our God apart from all the God's little g of the world, that would be the statement. There's no other God, small g, that people would follow on this earth would be coming as a servant. They would come as an overlord. They would come as a master with all kinds of intentions of making us work for whatever they were willing to give us. But that's not what we have. So no matter which of these gospels we consider, we must understand the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, taking in the gospel message as a whole. None of the either none of the books in particular, but the gospel message, the good news message as a whole. It's exclusive. And it's exclusive among all the world's religions, all the philosophies, all the beliefs. And it's so important today that we realize that. And I think it's even more important going forward from today that we hold on to that. Because so many things are competing for our allegiance and our loyalty and our worship today. I think there are things coming in the future that will challenge our beliefs in Jesus being the only way. And you may say, well, that wouldn't happen with me. And I'd say, be cautious. Because there will be an overwhelming message of the world, I believe, before our time is over that will challenge even the saints. Because the Bible says that will happen. That even the saints would be challenged to hold on to their belief. And it says that Jesus would shorten our days in order that that would not overcome us. And so that message, whatever is coming, and I have my opinions about what it'll be, is going to be powerful. But we need to understand that nothing can be equal to and nothing can subject the gospel message to itself. It is above all messages. It is completely and utterly exclusive. Jesus is, as he taught us, the only way. And we must hold on to that. You know, Paul warned against accepting any other gospel teaching. In Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, Paul said, I marvel that you, speaking to those around him, because he already saw the drift. Remember, this is believers that he's speaking to. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. There is no other gospel goes on to say, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And so we need to know that there's no other message. There is no other gospel. 
There is only one true gospel, one true good news, and it's about the only Son of God. So what sets this message apart from all others? Now, we could spend an eternity answering that question, but something I think we need to consider this morning, what sets it apart from any other message we're going to hear, any other philosophy, belief, religion. Again, from Galatians, earlier in that same chapter, by Paul's hand, he says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So the very first word I read there was grace. Grace that he who is God in the flesh would come and lay down his life that we might be delivered from this present evil age and the sin that we all bear since birth. That's grace. That is something not one of you, not myself included, deserves. No one has ever walked this earth, no one will ever walk this earth, deserves what Christ came to do and to give. That's what sets it apart. That he is the God that would give without us having to do a thing. And why would he do that? Because he loves us. Because God so loved the world that he would send. And he did. And we need to hold on to that because that's what sets it apart. That's what sets him apart. You know, from Ephesians On the same topic, chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, reminds us, for by grace you have been saved. That points right to him. That points right to the work he did. Bypasses us completely. By grace you have been saved through faith. That is our part. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. God's given each one of us this entirety of a life, a path to step upon and walk out with a purpose and a plan. He says that we're his workmanship, that he already set that up before you and I were even born. Workmanship, the Greek word poema, which we get our English word poem. We are part of the poem that he's read, which means there's there's a rhyme and a meter a cadence to every one of our lives that he has spoken. Our job is to discover that and then make sure that we're walking in those steps that he's laid out for us. And what a privilege to know that he already laid that out for us and we don't have to make it up as we go. Matter of fact, we spend so much time making it up as we go. And then we spend a lot more time trying to get over what we've made up. Look at verse 2 of our chapter. It is written in the prophets... Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So Mark here quotes from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, and from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. The words messenger here, and the word voice as written here, refers to John the Baptist, who I prefer to call John the Baptist the baptizer, because I don't want to stick him in any particular house of worship. Are you awake? That's what he was. He was John the baptizer. John was the prophet that God sent to prepare the way for his son. Now in ancient times, before a king visited any part of his realm, a messenger was sent before him to prepare the way. This included both repairing the roads and preparing the people. By calling the nation to repentance, John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord. Look at more of that verse from Isaiah chapter 40 with me, verses 3 through 5. It says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so John went out to proclaim this way, to make those ways straight. To bring the low ground high and the high ground low, so that the king can enter in on an equal playing field. And what is that playing field? What is that soil 
that Jesus would walk upon, that the Messiah would set his foot upon. And it, I tell you, is the heart of men. It is the heart of men and women. That's the soil that was being prepared. It's still the soil that the Holy Spirit prepares today. And based on the quality of that soil and its readiness to receive the seed really will dictate how that life responds. Jesus taught a parable about that. And so we really have a responsibility to always be looking at our hearts. To understand, is there ways within our hearts that are crooked that need to be set straight? Are there high places that need to be brought down? Are there low places that need to be brought up? How do we even that playing field? So God, in a sense, has a chance with us. Because so many times, I mean, we get the field clear and he begins to work in us and then we get our hands in there and we get our own desires and designs and plans in there and suddenly the way is not so straight anymore. And the ground's not so even. And so we do have a responsibility as we walk this life to work out that salvation with fear and trembling so that he can have all of us to work with. Look at verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So it says John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching. Now Jesus called John the greatest of the prophets. How would you like that? What a compliment. What a truth. Jesus spoke it. And the rugged wilderness where John ministered was a metaphor for the spiritual condition of the hearts that he called down into the waters. Now remember, these were the Jewish people that he was calling. Now, I'm not going to say there weren't any others amongst them, but this is the Jewish people that he was calling. Calling down into the waters of baptism. You know, I've met many Jews that don't yet know Jesus who would put baptism on the Christian side of the equation, not even understanding that it's really began with the Jews. But for the Jews, it wouldn't have been a whole body immersion. It would have been ritual cleaning, the washing of the hands and all the different things they had to do for different reasons and different celebrations and meals. The fact that John was calling them down into the very river to be completely immersed means that the Holy Spirit was doing a work on them such that they realized that they were unclean, fully unclean. That was a different work. It was the beginning of that new work that was coming. You know, John's ministry, with it, it was inspired with it by the recognition of man's sinful state and the fact that they needed to be cleansed of all their false righteousness. A lot of their false righteousness wasn't their own fault. It's what their religion had taught them, it, what had set them apart from all other people. His ministry was one of introduction. It was one of proclamation. John's message and baptism were preparation so that the people would be ready to meet and trust their Messiah. And his baptism was by water, we see. It was to be ceremonially cleansed, prepared. It goes back to the picture of setting things straight, of bringing the high places low and the low places high. A clean slate for the Lord to work. And that was a Water baptism versus the spiritual baptism that was coming. Or I should better say the baptism of the Spirit that was coming by the hand of the Lord. Which would be one to salvation. Not just to be cleansed for the arrival of Messiah, but for actual salvation. To be set apart. To be reconciled to God the Father. And John says here, there comes one after me who is mightier than I. Whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. As powerful as John was in his ministry, as powerful as it was his word going forth that it would call these Jewish people down into the river to be baptized, it was also one that was totally immersed in humility. Totally immersed in a humbleness that recognized his place versus the one that he was proclaiming to come. I think of John's words in his gospel, chapter 3, verses 30 and 31, where he says, He must increase but I must decrease. 
He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And so we always must really approach the throne of God boldly yet with humility. Understanding that he calls us to come boldly. But we must not come with pride. And we must come in recognition of the one that we approach. So I would ask this before we move on. Is John's ministry a model of our ministry today? I mean, should we not be proclaiming a preparation for his coming, for his return? Should we not be the ones that are bold enough to stand on the bank of the river and call down the people that they might be prepared to receive? And shouldn't we, as those who have received, be preparing ourselves for the day, that moment, that twinkling of an eye that he shows up unannounced? I think that should drive us to a humble, humble place. Verse 9 of our text. If it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now there's differences of opinion about who saw that, who heard that. I know Jesus did. I believe John did. Whether the rest around saw it, I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess if we were supposed to, it would tell us. But there was certainly now a total recognition. Maybe a reminder to Jesus himself about who he is. And maybe to John to just verify the ministry and the baptism that he just gave. Now here in those verses, the word beloved, it not only affirms the affection of Father God, but also carries the meaning of the only one. The servant that Mark speaks of, Jesus, he's the only begotten of the Father. So he's divinely exclusive and he's exclusively divine. There is no other like him. None. And I think that really needs to become the center of our thinking so that he becomes the center of our life. The psalmist wrote about this. Psalm 2 verse 7, he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So God the Father witnesses of the exclusivity of his son. The centrality of Jesus to all that we believe. And to all of scripture. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1 says. Behold my servant whom I uphold. My elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. So the father continues to point to this one. As the only one. Now notice here in this baptism. Baptism couple things that we need to understand about the relationship of the Holy Spirit with Jesus and with us. Now, the Spirit was with Jesus as He is with us all. That is one of the three states of the Holy Spirit as He exists and interacts with the world. Since creation, the Holy Spirit has been with the world. He was with Jesus. He's with us. And Jesus had the Spirit within Him as He was sent by the Father from the Father. So there was no need of reconciliation. Jesus came fully, not only with the Spirit with Him, but the Spirit within Him. Now that was the new relationship of the New Testament. Because even in the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God was with people. What we gain with salvation is that relationship of Him within us. And then there's a third relationship, the one that we see here and the one that's still available to all of us. And that is the Spirit coming upon Him. So in the Old Testament, there were two states of the Spirit with people. He was with the world always, and He would come upon a person to give power for service. The new relationship with Jesus here and our faith in him and his grace upon us is that he comes to live in us. So Jesus had a head start because he was God and man. 
So he came, spirit with him, spirit in him, and then we see the spirit now come upon him that he may begin service. Now my question to you is, if you're saved and you have the spirit within you, and you've already experienced even before that the spirit with you, then how important is if Jesus needed it that we should ask for it also, that the Spirit will come upon us for service and for power. We've talked about that before. Don't ignore that part of the relationship, what we call the baptism of the Spirit. Because that's where the power comes. And we're to be freshly filled with Him all the time. The Scripture literally says, being, being filled. Or no, it says, be, being filled. So we're always to be in a state of being filled. Something we ask for. It's not like he leaves us and he needs to come back. It's a third relationship that he would come upon us to give us power as he is here in this picture for Jesus. Now going forward, verses 12 through 28, we're going to see the authority of Jesus, the authority of the servant. And unlike an earthly servant being under authority and taking orders Jesus, as the servant, sent of God, exercises authority and gives orders. Even to demons, we will see. So now we're going to explore three scenes that reveal the authority of Jesus. The first scene, verses 12 and 13, will be his temptation. Then verses 14 through 22, his preaching. And then verses 23 through 28, what I've titled his command which really is his authority, but it really is his command. So beginning in verse 12, it says, Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Very interesting wording, that the Spirit drove him. It impelled him. It pushed him to go. And I think it's a good way to see how the Holy Spirit will work with us when we're open to His leading. The Spirit drove Him into the wilderness. Now, having come upon Him for power and ministry, He drives Him into the wilderness. What we see here is no time for Him to bask in the fact that He just got bathed in the river, His Father God spoke to Him, a dove came down. I mean, all that would have been like, let's go lay, let's go lay on the bank of the river. Soak up the warm afternoon sun. And real, let's just think about what just happened. There are moments that we get to rest like that. But I see an urgency, an urgency in the life of Jesus, but he never rushed. There was an urgency to be about his father's business, to do what his father told him to do, to speak the words that his father gave him, but he was never in a rush. But there was an urgency. And he never let anything overcome that urgency. His urgency was to be obedient. And I think we're to have that same urgency. To let the Spirit drive us. To not sit and to bask. As much as there will be seasons where we need to sit and wait upon the Lord. So often, he's just telling us to go. To go. To recognize the power that he's given us and go. Now, it's interesting that we have these 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness And it's interesting to compare that with the 40 years of the Hebrew nation in their wilderness. Because these 40 days were 40 days of total obedience. Where the 40 years for the Hebrew people was a reflection of their disobedience. The Hebrew people rejected the promise that God set before them and his power for them to enter in and take what he had given them. Because they'd listened to the enemy, the voice of the enemy. And they saw everything as insurmountable, too big for them. And Jesus could have done the same in his humanity. But what he did is he took the power he was given, he believed in the promise that was spoken, and he entered into that fight to overcome it by the power that he had. He overcame Satan's temptations, and he made a way into the promised land. Not the physical one, this was a spiritual inheritance this was a heavenly landscape that he was opening to all that would follow him there by believing in him and by experience that gift of grace that he would give when we have faith in him 
You know, some other comparisons, you know, Jesus entering into the promised land, a spiritual inheritance, a heavenly landscape. I think back to Joshua. Joshua, which is interesting because Joshua, his life, many parallels in that book, if you recall, with the life of Jesus, all the way to the fact of his namesake. Because Joshua in the Hebrew was Yahshua, which the Greeks took and translated as Jesus. So in our vernacular, Jesus would have been known as Joshua, or in the Hebrew, Yahshua, just as the character Joshua, the assistant to Moses, was known. And what did Joshua, the Yeshua of that Old Testament, do? He, in the, by the power of God, led the people where finally into the promised land. And how did he do that? With the assistance of the captain of the armies, who was that? It was Jesus himself, with Joshua. He had two Joshuas, one completely human and one divine, that led them into the physical promised land. Now here is our Yeshua, who leads us into a promised land, completely spiritual. And then there's another beautiful comparison in the scriptures, calling Jesus the last Adam. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 45, it says, and so it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the first Adam, you think about it, he was tested in a beautiful garden, and he failed. Jesus was tempted in a dangerous wilderness and won the victory. Adam lost his dominion over creation because of his sin. Jesus was without sin and took dominion over creation. He was with the wild beast and they did not harm him. In that we see Jesus demonstrating the future time of peace and righteousness. When the Lord shall return and establish his kingdom. And all of his creation will get along then. So then we come to scene two. Scene two is his preaching. Verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James and the son of Zebedee, John and John his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And he, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. <clears throat> so here we see Jesus depart from Judea, he journeys to Galilee. John the baptizer has been arrested by Herod at this point. And Jesus had already preached elsewhere, but Mark skips past that. And he moves right into this scene here. And as a reference, this journey to the Galilee is where Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well. So that's the journey that he just took before he came to this place. Now his preaching was with crowds, but as with the woman at the well, it's also with individuals. He meets us personally as well as he does meet us collectively. But Jesus' preaching was like no other because of the authority he had to proclaim God's truths. And why was that? Why was he so able? Why was the word itself so close to Jesus and Jesus to the word? John answered that for us in the beginning of his gospel. When John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now that word in the Greek for word is logos. Logos. And if you ever read about the word logos, there's usually a comparison with two other Greek words. There's logos, ethos, and pathos. 
An ethos would be speaking of a message going forth completely dependent on the personality that was giving the message. Then the word pathos means the message would go forth and it was totally energized or not by emotion. That's what would make it attractive or not. But then there's the word logos that they chose here to speak of not only the word but Jesus himself, which is where we get the word logic. But from logic you can make another jump to the word truth. Because Jesus is truth. His word, therefore, is truth because they're one and the same. And so that's why they chose the word logos because we don't need the personality to prove it to us. We don't need and should not get wrapped up in the emotion of it. It should come to us as what it is, pure and utter truth. And that's what Jesus represents. As a matter of fact, he told us in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And because of that, no one comes to the Father except through Him. And really the wording there, if we were to make it more clear, it says, I am the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Good, and it's interesting because not too far after that, was that verse that I read to you, in the beginning was the Word, a couple verses later, it tells us that in Him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. And that's what that Logos needs to be to us. The Word is the truth. It shines a light. And because of that light, we can see what are lies, what is not true. And notice what it says about how the people responded to His teaching. Verse 22, and they were astonished. Strong word. Astonished at His teaching. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And why did he teach as one who had authority? Because he had authority. He was the authority. And he was speaking first person. First logos. And what message did Jesus preach? Well, to answer that question, let's consider this scene from Matthew's gospel. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, it says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, now he quotes, Matthew quotes from Isaiah the prophet, and he says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. But listen, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now I want to emphasize that this morning. Because a lot of times when someone says, Well, what is the gospel message? They start with the forgiveness of sins. Now that is certainly good news. And that is certainly part of the gospel message. But he began to preach about repentance and the kingdom of God being at hand. And let me clear up one other thing. You will see in some places kingdom of heaven, and you'll see other places kingdom of God. Actually, Matthew's the only one who says kingdom of heaven. Everyone else says kingdom of God. And there have been many studies with, I think, much sweat on the brow to make those two different things. And I will give you my personal opinion. They are not. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two are the same thing. My opinion, although correct. But he began to pre preach this, to repent, and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, no doubt, considering the situation at the time, the Jews read into this that there would be a political solution to their situation of Roman occupation and rule. But the kingdom Jesus preached of has to do with his reign in the lives of his people. It's a spiritual realm, not a political association. Only way you enter the kingdom of God is by believing the good news and being born again. 
The gospel or good news of God comes from God and it brings us to God. The gospel of the kingdom reminds us that our faith in the Savior brings us into his kingdom. And so this kingdom is something that I see as we're constantly moving closer into its presence. But he tells us it is at hand. He said that 2,000 years ago. He's telling us it's imminent. It's close and it's imminent, meaning it's on its way in its fullness. It also tells us that when that moment comes, that it's coming, I mean like that last moment, it's going to happen fast. It's going to happen fast. But you know, the scripture also speaks about the gospel of grace. And you'll know that grace keeps coming up in this. Why? Because we're speaking about the good news. We're speaking about the kingdom of God and us being ushered into it. We're speaking about salvation and us being offered it as a free gift. All of those, all of those display God's grace. And so that good news, it includes the kingdom that is at hand. In order to get there, it calls us to a state of repentance. The same really with salvation. That doesn't mean we have to be completely repentant before we're saved. But we need to be in a process of understanding our current state and the state we need to move into. And understanding that the cleanup phase of that will happen once we put our faith in Him and receive that gift of grace. And He'll do His amazing work in us. So we need to understand that central to all this is this gospel of grace, this good news of grace. And I always say that grace is a lifetime study. If you're thinking, well, I don't have anything to study. Well, first of all... Really? But if you need something to study, study grace. I guarantee it will keep you busy. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus. Why? To testify to the gospel of grace of God. If you ever want to find something to tell others about, considering your life in Christ, don't search much if you think you need to. Just understand that grace is worthy of your time to speak to another person about. I always say that we've received grace to a degree that we have no understanding or ability to explain. And we are to be those that would go around and dispense that grace. We should be giving what we've freely received. And we should be giving it freely, not holding over anyone's head, not expecting anything before they can get it or anything in return once we give it. We need to be those that are just giving grace. And don't be afraid, oh, I'm going to give too much. None of us have yet given it all. And he did. And so don't be ever, ever be afraid to share it. Make it a priority to give it away. Recall, we considered this early, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. None are righteous, no, not one, Paul tells us in Romans. He goes on to say that none seek after God, none. Don't give yourself any credit for where you're at if you're a believer today. He wooed you into his presence. And if you haven't yet answered that call, don't be looking for your own works to get you there. Just answer. Just say, I do. Jesus' preaching proclaimed the gospel of grace and that it pointed to a place we cannot reach on our own. A relationship with the Father God that we cannot obtain apart from the work of Jesus. And the fact that we cannot earn it and we do not deserve it. Jesus preached that people should repent, which means change your mind. Now, a lot of times when we think about repentance, immediately because we're believers, we think about the heart. And the heart's important. But I'm pretty sure about 99.99999% of all sin begins here. And so the way back is here. Your heart will follow. Your heart and then your life will follow. Repentance means to change your mind. Because really that's what's been stolen away when you're in sin, your mind. He preached people should repent 
and believe. But repentance alone is not enough to save us. God expects us to turn from our sins, but we also must put our faith in His Son and believe in His promise of salvation. Because Jesus preached with authority, He was able to call men from their regular occupations and make them disciples. He did that then, calling the fishermen out. I never noticed before, there was a whole crew. I mean, that was a successful fishing business that they left. It wasn't just a couple kids and their dad. There was a whole crew there. And he was able just to call them, and they walked. You can imagine, well, I just want to see the look on Zebedee's face. Like, really? Yeah, remember that at dinner? Yeah, I mean. But he does the same thing today. He still calls us. He still calls us. And he calls us from our natural life into a supernatural life, a supernatural calling. And we see that Jesus preached in open spaces, but he also taught in the synagogues. Remember, Jesus was a rabbi. He taught in the synagogues as well. And it was customary to ask rabbis that were visiting the synagogues to read the scriptures and to teach. And that's where we begin this final scene, scene three, his command. Verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. So Jesus rebuked the spirit saying, Be quiet. Now, be quiet Elsewhere translated can be said, hold, hold thy peace. Literally, it means be muzzled. Now, Jesus is going to speak those same words when we get to chapter 4, when he tells the storm to come. Same words. Because he had command over the natural and the supernatural, seen and the unseen. And it took the presence of the Son of God to expose this demon. I mean, how many services had this man sat through with no evidence that he was demonized? Jesus not only exposed him, but he also commanded him to keep quiet about his identity and to depart from the man. See, the presence of God comes into a situation. The evil recognizes him. The evil recognizes him and will do everything he can to maintain his place. But when he's told to go in the name of Jesus, he must go. He must go. I don't know if you've ever had the experience as a believer by watching someone with an unclean spirit recognize you. I've talked to many believers that have been had the experience. You can be walking down the street, you can be walking through the mall, you can be sitting in traffic and feel the look and look over. And the spirit in them recognizes God in you. That power goes with us all. We have the authority in Jesus' name to continue his ministry. Sometimes we don't believe it. Sometimes we cower from it, but it is a truth no matter. <clears throat> now even though this demon attempted one last convulsion of the man that he was in, he had to submit to the authority of God's servant and come out. And the people that saw that were amazed and afraid. They realized that something new was taking place. It was a new doctrine, a new power, and now a new presence. Our Lord's words and works always go together. And now the people would begin and continue to talk about what they'd seen. And that's why so often Jesus told people that he healed, don't say anything. Because it was just bringing people around for the wrong reasons, but it didn't stop him from doing what he was capable of doing and what he was called to do. Now, it's interesting to note as we begin to close this morning, in describing the man who was demon-possessed, Mark used the exact grammar 
that Paul used to describe the Christian being in Christ. Same words. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, Paul writes, But of him you are in Christ Jesus. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. And so I love those words, as painful as they can be. Examine yourselves. Often when we come into that time of communion, as we will hear shortly, I say, let the Lord examine your heart. Make sure that you're right with Him. Make sure that there isn't something there that's blocking Him from all of you. Now, if you're saved, if truly you are blood-bought this morning, a child of God, then Jesus will not leave you nor forsake you. But we can have things in us that by degrees separate us from Him. Never 100%, but any percentage is something that we want to get rid of. So that we're not disqualified in a sense of having the fullness of Him in our lives. And yet my point here was that He used the same exact words for this evil spirit in a person as he used for God's presence. So we need to, because we marvel at, the, at, at a picture of somebody being possessed. It's like, wow, it's like amazing. Look, he cast out the spirit. And we have no problem seeing that man, woman possessed, that that spirit's in them. Yet over here, sometimes we act like Jesus is over there. But as believers, same phrase, he's in John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus' great prayer. After finishing the praying for his disciples, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe, that would be you and I this morning, in me through their word, that they all may be one. Listen, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they, us, also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, and they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, and they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. We have a home in Jesus. Jesus takes up his home in us by faith because of grace. It's a big part of this gospel message. And Mark is imploring us to take that and to go. Do something. With it. Live a life worthy of that. Now we don't get to earn our salvation, but I like to remind us, and some people get uncomfortable with this, we get to earn what we get to brag about when we stand before the Lord and He says, what did you do with me? He'll look at you as a believer and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because he loves you and he saved you and you've been his. But yet we get to stand there and we get to say what our life was about with him included. And then there's this thing about crowns. Now a lot of us need motivation. A lot of us need a carrot on a stick. Have any of you ever owned a crown? I haven't. Do you want one? Why not work for it? Not towards salvation. But faith without works are dead. Why not work for that? I'd love to have an armful. Crushes me to my knees. And the cool thing is they're not mine. I don't get to keep them anyway. As soon as I'm giving them, I give them right back to the one they belong to. And I just say that not, not to be funny, but to challenge us. Challenge us to have the immediacy in our heart that Mark is displaying here. To go. To go. Figure out what it is that God's calling you to do. Go do it. Go do it. Go try it. Go practice it. Go stumble it upon it. It's okay. There's no harm, no foul. But sitting still, hmm. yeah, you'll be saved. And yeah, you'll stand before the Lord. And you'll enter into His kingdom. Just think there's so much more. So much more. And that's not to put us in competition with one another. Because I think God loves as he said, the least of these, even amongst his people. There are, there are no minor gifts. There are no minor ministries. 
There's only service to God. So in the right sense, we're, those of us who believe, are Jesus-possessed. And some of you may go, oh, don't say it that way. But if I can look upon a man or a woman who's possessed of evil and see the power that that has over them, their body, their life, then, then, then I want to be possessed of Jesus and let him take over me. I mean, I know that's what happened when I was first reborn. Because that wasn't me. You all have those stories when you were first saved. You did things, said things you never did before. Unfortunately, it fades. I mean, I was, uh, the only words I could ever use every time I tell the story, I mean, is I was goofy for Christ. I mean, I was the most reserved, quiet, standoffish, don't get near me unless you're in my household person. And suddenly I'm marching up and down the side of soccer fields watching my kids play soccer with these big old purple shirts that said Jesus all over the place. And I was just excited to be his child. I think even Jesus looked at me and went, who is this? It fades though. I don't, I don't know why it fades. It bothered me that it fades. <laughs> I remember I told that story at another church here in town and some of you know Jackie who comes back and forth. And, and I, I guess I told the story in such a way that I sort of said that I was going to return to those days. But she buys me a big old bright Jesus shirt. And I realized, I was like, oh man. Oh man. Yeah. You know, but that possession of Jesus, we need to see that he's filling that filling by him and his influence over us is only for good only for good he'll never do anything wrong through us there'll never be any evil in us because of him he takes us over when we give ourselves to him to do good to fulfill his plans in Jeremiah chapter 29 it says for I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord Thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. You will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. So whatever has us captive this morning. Now, that could be a big word if you're not saved. If you're not saved, then this good news that we're talking about this morning is for you, as it was for those of us that are now saved. And your captivity, if you're not saved, is strong, and it's large, and it's deep, it's wide, and it is impossible for you to climb away from without the power of God. And so you have that choice today to accept the good news that the kingdom is at hand, and all you have to do is change your mind first about who Jesus is, and then about what your life is really like. And then move into the rest of that good news, which is the forgiveness of sin, by simply putting your faith in Him and receiving that gift, which is grace. For the rest of us, our captivity comes and goes. And when we recognize and feel that we're not within the plans that He set for us, it's probably because we've been taken captive by another or something else. And we need to know that He'll bring us back from our cat captivity when we seek Him, when we search for Him, when we go and we pray to Him, when we repent, when we change our minds about where we're at. Because here's the truth I'm going to end with, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence and the power may be of God and not of us. Not of us. This is all about Him. And the only way we can have any relationship with this is to simply surrender to it. Yield to it. Throw ourselves at the mercy of it. Enter into the grace of it. You know, sometimes we have those Christianese things we tell our story and we talk about the day we accepted Christ. We found Christ. 
I, I know we say those words, and I'm not trying to harp on anybody that would use them. I do too. But we need to get real about what we're saying. I didn't accept Christ. I didn't even find Christ. He found me. He accepted me on the cross is where he accepted me, where he accepted you. And he does all of that so the power is his and not of us. And so we just need to yield in all things in a continuous fashion so that we can accept all the goodness that is his. I'm real excited about this study. I'm real excited about what Mark's going to take us through. It's going to be a, a marching pace, just like the Romans that he wrote to. So make sure that you're armored up. Because you remember when Paul wrote Ephesians 6 and he put all that picture of the armor of God together, he was observing a Roman soldier and all that they, all that they wore, because he was in captivity in Rome, writing to the church in Ephesus, literally chained to the Romans all day long. Or as I like to say, they were chained to Paul all day long. But he was looking at the garb that they wore, and he knew when they went to war, one of the most important things that they wore was their footwear. And anybody that's been in the military, especially in the days of Vietnam and before, know all about footwear. There were more men in Vietnam that were put on the sidelines by problems with their feet than anybody that was shot or injured in any other way. Because the quality of the footwear back then was so poor. So they finally came out with Vortex and all the rest to keep feet dry. But one of the pieces of the army is shotting yourself, shotting yourself, shotting your feet with the piece. Now the Roman soldiers, they had their boots or sandals that they would march in. But the other thing that they had were basically a pair of strap-on cleats. You may have seen those kind of cleats you can buy to go aerate your lawn. They were big steel cleats. And in certain environments they would strap them onto their feet as well so that their footing would be sure as they battled. And so I would encourage you to go as we take this journey with Mark as he te teaches this kind of Romanesque, if you will, marching sense of the gospel that we make sure that we have that armor on. That we could, we could shod our feet so that we could stand fast as he goes on to say. And having done all to stand, stand. Because I believe we're going to learn things in this gospel that maybe we just need refreshing on. Some of you maybe you'll hear for the first time. But what we see in this gospel is the power of God go forth. There's no waiting around. There's no prayer meetings. There's no, well, let me really see if that's what the Lord said. It's about knowing what the Lord said. Believing what the Lord said. Standing in the truth and the power of that. And then going. 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 Part of the Great Commission. Go. First thing he said. Go. Worship come up. Ushers come forward. So now where we're going to go is to the communion table. I don't invite you there. The Lord does. I'll go back to what I said a few minutes ago. This is the place, I believe, to not only recall what He did for us, but to examine ourselves before Him. Best way, opening our hearts and letting Him tell us what He sees there. So that we can turn the entirety of our lives over to His purposes. That's good news. So Father, we thank You for the Word. Thank you for this opportunity to begin this study. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts as we go forward to receive all the instruction that you have for us, Lord. That we may hear the call to go. And that we may hear the call to come to a place where you are already at work. And that we would know that we don't go on our own, but we go in your power as long as that's what we're asking for. So Lord, as we come to the table this morning, Lord, help us to lay our hearts open before you that we might hear from you about what you see so that as we take the cup and take the bread, we know that we're giving all of ourselves to you because 
What we celebrate here is the fact you gave all of yourself for us. Thank you, we praise you. Give you all honor and glory. We love you, Lord. Pray these things in Jesus' name.